it perfectly. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? All right. Well, I am excited because it's Christmassy time, and we're singing some Christmas songs this morning as we worship God, which is always fun to do, right? Yes. Only during Christmas time, though. So. Um, board members, we've got a meeting after church this morning. Uh, we'll be down in the blue room. We've got quite a bit of stuff to do, so we'll run through it quickly. And then uh, the other thing I want to mention is next Saturday is, is Perry Glasgow's funeral. And that'll be here. Uh, thank you to everyone who has already signed up for desserts and salads and, and helping serve the family with the meal afterwards. Um, we're going to get the, the, school, the, the gym set up after school on Tuesday. And, and we're going to have a, a, an amazing opportunity to serve yet another family who's going through a tough time. So please continue to be praying for them as well. And uh, that'll be... Saturday the 16th at 10 a.m. here at the church. So please be praying for them, and then uh, let's have a good morning today worshiping God. Father, we love you so much. Father, I'm excited to be here this morning. Being in your presence is joyful. It's a joyful experience. Father, help us to focus on you this morning. Block out all the distractions, the busyness of the of the year, the season, and help us to focus on you because you are worthy of our attention. You are worthy of all that we are. And we should give all that we are back to you. We love you. And we want to worship you this morning. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Welcome, everyone. Good day to be in the Lord's house today. Good to see each one. For unto us is born a child. For unto us a child is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of his increase, of the government and of peace there will be no end and on and the, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this this is a writing of Isaiah and this was written 700 years before Christ came and um I looked up last night, there are over 350 prophecies in the Old Testament of Christ's coming and about Christ. And I just think it's amazing how God had, has put this all in place and he's a, a God of order. And uh, so with that, I invite you to stand with us as we sing this morning and uh, we're singing to the, the God that has orchestrated Christmas. <coughs> Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy. Wonders 
wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders familiar. It goes on the tune of Crown Him with Many Crowns, but it, this is a Christmas version. Crown Him with Many Crowns, the King who left His throne. Creator of the universe, born to the Come to us, oh crown him. 
Awake, my soul, and sing. God sent His Son for me. Now hail Him as Thy matchless King through all eternity. Crown Him, crown Him, crown Him with many crowns. Crown Him, crown Him, crown Him with many continue worshiping this morning through communion. I'm excited for this. Uh, it's a time where, as believers, we get to come together with the rest of the church across the world throughout history who has participated in this event of remembering what Christ has done for us. And so for communion, all we ask is that you're a believer, that you have realized that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, that you understand there's nothing that you could possibly do on this earth to ever earn your own salvation. And if you believe and you've trusted in Christ as your Savior and Lord, then I'm going to ask that you please feel free to participate and, and join with us as we take communion this morning. So if I could have a few men to come up, and we'll, we will pass out the elements and uh, take communion together.
So as we prepare to take communion this morning, we must recognize that we are broken. No one here is perfect. And even though the old is gone and the new has come, if, as believers, Christ still wants us to grow in our maturity. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, there's nobody perfect other than Christ. And the amazing thing is that we've been given grace by God for our imperfections. And by believing in Jesus as our Savior, you have been counted as perfect in his eyes. So I'm going to ask you to take just a few minutes this morning, and we're going to sit here in quiet. We're going to bow our heads. If you feel led to, to kneel, do that. But I want you to go before God. I want you to worship God for who he is and what he has done for us. Pray for his kingdom to come on this earth and for his will to happen in your life as you prepare to take these elements. And seek forgiveness for anything that you might need forgiveness for. And then thank him for that forgiveness. So let's take a moment to ourselves and, and do this. The Apostle Paul writes that on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Amen. Thank you, God. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because without that sacrifice, Without Jesus doing what he did on our behalf, we would still be lost in sin. We would be confused and trying to figure out our own way of paying off this debt that we would never be able to pay off. But thankfully, you took care of that debt for us. Our debt has been paid and we have been forgiven. Thank you, God, so much for that gift. Help us not to let a day go by when we forget what you have given us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have the scripture read. Good morning, church. Scripture reading this morning is Matthew 7, verse 12. In everything, therefore, 
treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Open our minds and our hearts to receive the word that you're going to give us through Pastor Trent this morning. We raise up this worship this morning to you, and we raise up the ones and those people that are sick and hurting. And Lord, with the passing of a couple people in our, in our uh, community and everything, I get to thinking that the older I get, and we do not know what the future holds for us, but we do know the one who holds the future. Your word tells us if we confess our sins and confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we can live in the shadow of the cross. And Lord, with that in mind, we raise this up to you this morning. I ask the ushers to come forward. May we give back to you a portion of what you greatly give us. And Lord, <clears throat> thank you for this day. And we raise you up in praise and glory. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I uh, recently saw a question on Twitter that I thought was kind of funny, and it took me down a, a long rabbit hole for quite a while uh, that, that I just had to keep on scrolling and looking at the comments on this, this Twitter post. The question that somebody asked was this, what has been your least favorite job of all time? And, and some of the... the answers to this response and this question were fantastic and when we're gonna I'm gonna read some of them to you this morning as we get started one guy wrote that his least favorite job was he was the guy who handled the pets and and the animals that had been put down at a veterinary clinic and, and he said having to deal with that and seeing families pets was really hard for him to do and that would be a hard one right one guy wrote that, that his job was, uh, which is probably one of my, would have been my least favorite jobs, that he was a, a small space extermination technician, meaning he crawled around under houses and in small crevices to take care of snakes and other little creatures that people didn't want there anymore. I couldn't do that one. One lady wrote that she was the one who had to pick up and, and clean out uh, portable toilets after concerts and events. That would be a, 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 a fantastically terrible job, right? <laughs> and there were so many more, and, and I could go down that list if, if we had more time, but, but it's interesting to see what different people consider to be their least favorite job. There wasn't really one that was similar to the other one. And now, we need to understand that work is a gift from God, right? 
And, and we should be thankful for the work that we do. And, and I get that, but there's also a part of me that says some jobs are, are not very high on the, the desirability scale, right? Some jobs will be pretty difficult to do for all of us. And, 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 and if I were to ask you guys what you thought would be your least favorite job of all time, I'm sure we would be able to create our own list as well. Even though we know that work is a gift from God. So instead of asking that question, I'm going to ask you this question instead. Desirable or not, how can we find meaning and purpose and fulfillment in the jobs that we are asked to do? How do you find value in the job that you're currently doing right now? Now, on one level, the simple answer is this. We, we do the job we're doing now because it gives us money. And that's understandable because we all need money to support family. and We, we need money to provide for our family and, and pay our bills and, and so on and so forth, right? We're willing to do a certain amount of undesirable tasks because we need, one, those tasks to be done, but we also need the value of money to come back to help us continue to live. But I'd be willing to bet that there's no one here who has an absolutely burning passion to do those most undesirable tasks, right? Money is a motivator. But there has to be something greater than money. There should be something greater than money that, that, that should be our ultimate motivator. Am I wrong? Would you agree with that? The text that we're going to look at today in Ephesians chapter 6 shows us that we need Christ to be our ultimate motivator. Christ needs to be our ultimate boss, and, and, and ultimately, he needs to be our ultimate master. And your job may completely stink. I, uh, it may be terrible, but there is some good news, is that you can transfer your master without having to transfer your job. And I don't mean that, that you'll never have to leave the job that you're doing now, but in whatever job that you do have now, the most important thing to know is that you can choose the ultimate master of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Paul teaches us in this section of Ephesians that, that the lordship of Christ should affect the way that we view work. And the main purpose of this passage is this, is that we can exalt Christ through our various jobs both the jobs that we like to do and the jobs that we would probably rather pay somebody else to do if we could. And one of the blessings that came from the Protestant Reformation was, was this renewed emphasis in living out one's calling or one's vocation to the glory of the Lord, to the glory of Christ. The, the Reformers believed that, that a person's vocation, a person's job, was his or her special calling that require God-given talents. They also thought that, that God was active in their daily labor and, and their family responsibilities and their social dealings. So, so their worship was their work. Martin Luther once said that as you pray the Lord's Prayer, you should remember how God provides the daily bread that we have. And he does so through the farmers, through the transportation industry, through the real retailers. God doesn't just drop daylight donuts on our plate every morning, even though that would be pretty awesome, right? Every part of our economic food chain is how God provides through the work of the people doing those jobs. It's all done under Christ. And we need to understand this because for some of us, it's difficult to find a connection between our faith and our work. But as 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. So as Christians, the jobs that, that we do 
we should do it for the glory of God. So the title of today's sermon, as you can see, is Transferring Masters as Slaves. And before we make any specific application to our jobs, we must talk about the original context that Ephesians chapter 6, verses 9 through 5 was written in. The original context in slaves and masters. For the last several weeks, we've been dealing with these household codes, and we've been looking at how husbands and wives need to leave spiritually filled marriages, and how fathers and mothers and children are to behave within these gospel-centered families. And both of these discussions were on the heels of what we read in chapter 5, verse 21, which says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So in our marriages, we are to submit to one another. In our parenting and as children, we are to submit to one another. And we'll see today, as masters and slaves, we are to submit to one another. And so Paul turns his attention to this last and possibly one of the most difficult subjects in the household. And unfortunately, it's typical for pastors and commentaries alike to jump directly to the application of this passage and make it all about employees and employers. And, and, and I think that's an appropriate application for us to make and one that we will make at the end. But we need to remember that, that there isn't a direct correlation here. Biblical era slaves are not equal to modern era, era employees. And if we move too quickly from masters and slaves to employers and employees, we're going to miss a rather important application that we can find in this passage. Further, if we move too quickly from masters and slaves to employers and employees, we risk bypassing the most obvious elephant in the scripture. Why doesn't Paul just outright ban slavery? Because the church, the, the capital C church that we are, we all are, or we should be, vehemently against human slavery. And if that's the case, what do we make of this passage that, that kind of is lacking concerning the ethical question of slavery or no slavery? So to understand this text and, and apply it properly, we need to consider this passage in three different parts here. And we're going to look at an explanation, and we're going to look at the exhortations, and then we're going to apply these passages to our lives. So let's pray for understanding and soft hearts this morning, because I think we might desperately need to have God's understanding as we look at this passage this morning, and soft hearts to know how to understand and use this passage to become better followers. So Father God, right now, I ask that you soften the heart of everybody in this room. Father, I ask for understanding that only comes from complete faith in you. We surrender to your word. We surrender to your understanding right now, God. And we pray this in your son's perfect name. Amen. So go ahead, grab your Bible, turn it on if you're losing an electronic Bible, and go to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're in week 14 of this series. We only have one more week, and it's gone by way too fast, in my opinion. 15 weeks in Ephesians is pretty fast. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed preaching through it. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 5, we'll be reading through verse Nine. It says, Slaves, obey your masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Masters, 
Treat your slaves the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. Realizing I forgot my cough drop and my drink. So let's begin to break this passage down. We're going to start with the explanation so that we can understand the context of slavery, and then we'll see Paul's undermining of slavery in this passage. So two points regarding slavery. First of all, that the practice of slavery in Paul's day, in large part, should be understood more as indentured servitude. It was vastly different from what we understand slavery to be and, and what we have kind of understood it to be in, in recent American history. Slavery in the context of Ephesians chapter 6, it, it, it was a temporary contract, usually to pay off debts. It was not based on, on social economic classes or racial bias. American slavery was primarily based on racial bias, and it was a forced lifelong ordeal with zero hope of becoming freed. So there's a big distinction here that needs to be made by how we understand slavery in the context of Ephesians chapter 6 before we move on. And these are just some of the similarities, but, but for the most part, they, uh, the, the two forms of slavery that we know of today and what we are talking about in Ephesians 6 were vastly different from one another. The second point that needs to be made is with Paul's commands here in this passage. He commanded, uh, sorry, his commands never mandated slavery within the church. They, he only tried to regulate slavery. Some scholars estimate that there were nearly 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire during this time. And about a third of all the people in the Ephesus region were slaves. It was a very accepted and an allowed part of the Mediterranean world's economic life. Listen to this bit on slavery in Egypt that I found while researching this week. It says, in the Greco-Roman world, slavery was much a part of life that hardly anyone thought about whether it might be illegitimate. They did not merely do menial work. They did nearly all the work, including oversight and management in most professions. Some slaves were even more educated than their owners. They could own property, and they were allowed to save money to buy freedom. No slave class existed, for slaves were present in all but the highest economic and social strata. Many gained freedom by the age of 30. Slaves were known as clerks, cashiers, and bookkeepers in ancient Greece and Rome. And they manned not only the lower levels of such work, but the upper levels as well. Banks were owned by the wealthy Greek and Roman families, but the officers who were in charge of them could be either slave or free. And those who were able to buy their freedom and gain their freedom, their freedom brought with it a precious gift of citizenship within the Roman Empire. I found that interesting, and I, and I hope that the, this little history lesson on slavery in the Roman world is, uh, shows us that it's not anywhere close to what we consider slavery in the early part of our country's history. So how did someone become a slave during this time? People became slaves through various avenues, birth, parental selling or abandonment, we looked at that last week, captivity and war, inability to pay debts, or voluntary attempts to better one's condition. So what we know as slavery was, was mainly racial, and it was executed by a lot of self-righteous, proud, arrogant people. For the most part, it was a harsh and cruel world. And, and while that's probably true for some people in the Roman time period, for the most part the slave's circumstance was much better and it depended completely on their masters. So Paul's words to masters here in verse 9 would have been life-altering to all parties involved. The 
there's one question I've been asked about this passage over and over again, and, 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 and as the Bible as a whole, and it's this. If the church is vehemently against human slavery, then why does the Bible refuse to condemn slavery and, and almost seems to endorse it? And, and the answer is, it doesn't. Plain and simple. There's never any place in Scripture that condones slavery. Neither this passage nor any other passage encourage the abuse of power or the mistreatment of human beings. But the question remains, why doesn't Paul and the rest of the New Testament writers call for the end of slavery here? Why don't they just say more in opposition to this specific topic? And the first answer that I have is, is a rather pragmatic answer. Christians in this early church were a very insignificant group of people compared to the Roman Empire. Their religion itself wasn't even fully lawful at this point. So, so they were kind of completely powerless within the political realm to change any of these ideas. Additionally, there. Uh, uh, the apparent silence in Scripture was because so many slaves were constantly and, and easily being freed from their bondage. Some historical documents have recorded that nearly 500,000 slaves were freed 50 years before Christ was born up into his birth. That's an astronomical amount of people gaining their freedom. But these are some reasons, perhaps, why Paul doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking about this topic on, on, in Ephesians. He was writing instructions for the household and, and household relationships and the responsibilities given to people within the society. His goal with Ephesians wasn't to change the entire social structure of the Roman Empire. But with that being said, the Bible does and clearly opposes the type of slavery that we think of today. And I base that statement off of several obvious biblical convictions. First, in Luke chapter 10, we are called to love our neighbors, not own our neighbors. Taking people against their will is sinful and the opposite of the greatest commandment that God, uh, that Jesus gave to us. The second, as we read this morning, Matthew chapter 7 says that, that we are to do to others whatever we would like them to do to us. Again, that would include ripping someone from their homes, being transported somewhere against their wills, and forcing them and abusing them to work for us. Simply put, slavery is against the golden rule that we've all been taught since children. Third, neither slavery nor masters were ever really viewed in a positive way in Scripture. Of course, with the exception of Jesus Christ as our master. And we're going to get to him in a little bit. Israel was in awful slavery in Egypt, but God freed them. And, and after God freed them, he gave them very strict instructions insisting that they do not ever treat others the way that they had been treated in Egypt. And fourth, one of the pictures of the gospel as a whole is freedom from bondage. Jesus came to set the spiritual captives free. The gospel is about freedom, not slavery. And the fifth and, and final reason that I have, uh, that I see from Scripture is this. Paul's teaching and other New Testament teachings are constantly undermining the basic principles and ideas of slavery. And we're going to look at that today. They destroyed slavery from within. The, the attack uh, came to the heart and not the policy. Paul wasn't silent about slavery. He just attacked it differently. So how does he do this? Well, Paul told us in chapter 5, verse 1, he told us to imitate God. So let's ask the question, who is God? Psalm chapter 68 says that God is the father to the fatherless, the defender of the widows. Psalm 146 verse 9 says that God is a God of justice and compassion. God stands up to the oppressors. He stands against the oppressors. He, he cares for the vulnerable. 
And these are the characteristics, some of the characteristics of God that we are to imitate. And, and having these characteristics of God quite clearly show the opposite idea of slavery, right? Paul also calls human trafficking and, and slavery, slave selling uh, lawless and godly and sinful in 1 Timothy. And we see in Exodus 21, the, the Old Testament law had some fairly harsh dealings with those who would kidnap, whether they were caught in possession of their victims or if they had already sold them into slaves. And that punishment was death, being stoned. So we could see Paul, just like the other Old Testament writers, did in fact teach against the act of slavery explicitly by attempting to change the hearts of the people, the hearts of those who owned and sold slaves. And here, Paul speaks of appropriate conduct within the existing social state without condoning it. And he forbids the act of enslaving others through kidnapping and slave trade. Paul also undermines slavery by teaching equality among groups in all of the prison epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and, and as well as in the book of Galatians. He says equality among people is necessary. It's a clear and constant theme throughout those books because in Christ, we are all equal and united. So in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, Paul continues to plant this seed of the downfall of slavery through Christ. It's subtle, yes, but it is powerful. And by, he does it by focusing on, on the spreading of the gospel in a society that approved and, and needed slavery to survive. And that's Paul's main concern here as we read these past, this passage. It's the spreading of the gospel in Ephesus. And in that, he discusses the ethics required between Christian slaves and Christian masters to illuminate a required change in relationship between masters and slaves. By changing how masters and slaves were to engage with and relate to one another, the approved institution of slavery in the society was under attack. So how does Paul tell them to, to relate to one another? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. I don't understand how there's still flies. Paul admonishes both the slave and the master to treat each other as if they were treating Christ. As you read these five verses, you can notice that in each verse, either Christ, Master, or Lord are mentioned. It says, serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God. As though you were working for the Lord. The Lord will reward each of us. Have the same, you have the same master in heaven. You see, the following the, the instruction in these verses would require both masters and slaves to move beyond the golden rule of just doing what you would want someone to do to you, and it pushes them to treat others this, with the same fear and respect that they had for Christ. That worldview alone should have uh, uh, begun to abolish slavery for all Christians. And even more in verse 9, Paul reminds both masters and slaves that, that they were under the same lordship of Christ. He says that Christ has no favorites. Paul could have spent weeks writing pages, sorry, scrolls after scrolls after scrolls quoting the Old Testament law that has been found in Exodus 20 through 24 to the Ephesians, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he chose to constantly come back to Christ in these verses. Let me ask you this question. If both masters and slaves 
understood that they were living under the watchful eye of Christ, how would that have changed the work ethic of the slaves and the treatment given by the masters? I think it would have changed everything. That's the undermining that Paul was doing here. They both were to live with this awareness that Christ is the ultimate master, that he is the ultimate judge. And, and with Christ in that position, Paul says there was no partiality. Everybody is equal. Paul was calling on masters to show justice and compassion and fairness towards the slaves. And, and, and this idea that we see here has been found nowhere else in the legal code in Paul's day. And yet Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 9, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. We can and, and we should move on with the understanding that this book, nowhere in this book, neither Paul nor the biblical writers ever endorsed slavery. In fact, this book completely undermines it at the heart of what it is. Slavery eventually did die out in this region because of the influence of Christianity. And yeah, there, there were some slaves in the Ephesian congregation. There were some slaves that were listening to this letter being read to them with the rest of the church. But they were not second-class members of that church. They were both brothers and sisters united in Christ. And that's the first part of this passage that we're going to look at this morning, the explanation, that the context of where Paul's coming from. And sometimes there's a lot of context that needs to get talked about and considered before we move on to the content of the passage. And this is one of those times. So let's move on. We're going to look at the exhortations, the specific exhortations that Paul gives to slaves and masters in this passage. And as we do so, we need to consider and apply Paul's revolutionary thoughts that we just worked through concerning slaves and masters to this text. So let's look at the exhortation to the slaves first. And as I said before, each verse here has a reference to Jesus Christ. So if you ask me, the overall command is pretty clear in this passage. The command is to live all of your life for Christ. While slaves were to obey their masters, they were to see Christ as their ultimate master. And this is that urging of slaves to transfer masters. Even if they couldn't transfer their jobs, they could transfer masters. And by doing so, Paul is calling them to have this Christ-centered perspective. He's calling them to understand a, a higher way of thinking than simply serving some man who I owe a debt to. And with this overarching motive in mind, they should be able to glorify Christ in their work. And in verses 5 through 8, Paul gives us four ways this exemplary service should look. So the four ways to glorify Christ as slaves. The first one is this. They should glorify Christ by working respectfully. Paul says they were to obey with a deep fear and respect, which actually carries the same idea of the verse that we started out with in, in chapter 5, verse 21, that they were to serve with, out of reverence for Christ. They were to take work seriously. They were to, uh, take, to, to reverently take work because they were serving Christ, not man. The second way, Paul says, is this, that they should glorify Christ by working wholeheartedly. Notice the emphasis of the heart in these verses. Paul says, serve them sincerely. Do, it with, uh, do the will of God with all of your heart. Paul urged the slaves not to be hypocrites, only working when the boss is present. He says, try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. It was a common temptation for masters to threaten their slaves. 
But it was also a common temptation for slaves to be lazy and, and dishonest with their work ethic. Both masters and slaves were to remember that Christ sees all things and work wholeheartedly to glorify Christ. Third, slaves should glorify Christ by working willingly. Paul says they should work with enthusiasm and not with a resentful heart. He tells them to put their whole heart and soul into their work because after all, they were working for the Lord rather than for people. So Paul encourages a cheerful and glad service as a slave. And finally, the, the fourth exhortation for the slaves. Slaves should glorify Christ by working expectantly. Paul reminds them that the ultimate reward is coming. He says, remember that the Lord will reward each of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. You see, no act goes unnoticed. Believers will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and, and we will be rewarded based on our present faithfulness. And so think about how this perspective of working expectantly should change the way a slave's uh, slaves were to work. Respectfully, wholeheartedly, willingly, and expectantly. Now let's switch sides and look at the exhortations that, that Paul gives to masters concerning the treatment of slaves. And there are four of them that we can pull from this one verse. And again, these ideas would have been very countercultural and life-changing to the men and women in this congregation hearing them. So first of all, masters should glorify Christ by practicing mutuality. Paul says, treat your slaves in the same way. Masters were to treat their slaves as they wanted to be treated. Meaning, integrity, respect, humility, and gentleness. They were to treat them as if they were treating Christ. If masters wanted respect and faithful service, then they should give respect and faithful leadership to their slaves. Second, masters should glorify Christ by avoiding hostility. Don't threaten them, Paul says. Continuing to build off of what, what Paul has kind of already built in Ephesians, Christians and, and Christian masters were to be different than the rest of the world, the rest of culture. Masters were not to bully or use aggression toward their slaves. Third, masters should avoid, uh, sorry, masters should glorify Christ by living Christ with Christ-centered accountability. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven. Masters were to live in fear and reverence of Christ. And the book of Proverbs speaks on this equal, uh, equal accountability of the rich and the poor a few different times. Proverbs 22 says, The rich and the poor have, the same, have this in common. The Lord made them both. Proverbs 29 says, The poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives sight to their eyes. Proverbs 15 says, The Lord is watching everywhere, keeping his eye on both evil and the good. An awareness of this truth that, that we are equal, that we have the same accountability, is, is a sobering truth, and it should change the way that we live. And the fourth thing, masters should glorify Christ by remembering God's impartiality. Again, Paul says, God has no favorites. Partiality was written into the Roman law. Roman citizens were far and above the rest of the world. And, and after that, there were numerous class systems in place, including freedmen and foreigners and enslaved men. 
But by saying he has no favorites, Paul is telling us that in the end, partiality on earth will play no role when we're standing before God because Jesus is completely and utterly impartial. And all of these exhortations from both for the slaves and for the masters should, were designed, were written to shorten the distance between slave and master at this time. It would have been a radical teaching from Paul. So what? Perhaps you've been thinking this morning, Pastor Trent, I'm not a slave, nor do I have any slaves, so can't we just put this passage aside and move on? And the answer is no. We can't do that because if we can properly apply this passage to our own lives, it too can lead to a radical, life-altering change in the way that we view God and in the way that we view all people. So what can we take from this passage about slaves and masters? This passage should change the way that we work. No work is merely just work but it's a way that we serve Christ. Think about the employee and employer's relationship for just a moment. I told you we were gonna look at this application. If these principles were applied, uh, if these principles were to be applied to those sometimes awful working situations, then how much more should we seek to apply them to live them out better in positive working conditions. Now you might be thinking, my job is terrible, it, it stinks. And I know that feeling, I've been there before. And, and maybe it does, maybe the current situation is not the best situation that you've ever been in. But there's one thing that you can do to consider that your life is not being physically threatened or abused and, and you're not being treated like property the way that some slaves were. And if that's where you find yourself right now, then you can remember that, that Jesus is your ultimate boss. You might be working for a stinker right now. Don't look around if that stinker's in the room. But with Jesus as our ultimate boss, our ultimate master, it's not that bad anymore, is it? So transfer your master of who you're working for to the ultimate master of Jesus. And now specifically for employees, those who are employees, I encourage you to work through Christ, like Christ, and for Christ. Let's break these down real quick. Work through Christ. Remember that, that Paul is addressing the Christian church in this letter. These are believers in Christ who have been spiritually raised from death to life and saved by grace through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And as a result, they have been given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within them. They and we do not live our lives, love our spouses, raise our kids, or work our jobs alone. Instead, Christ abides within us. The Holy Spirit is indwelling within us. So do your work through Christ. Be filled with the Spirit. You can do your job not through your own power, but through the strength that Christ gives you. If you're in a tough place, if your job stinks, try praying before you go to work. Pray for the Spirit to fill you and for God to use you as a missionary, sharing God's love and grace in the environment that you're working in. Work through Christ. Work like Christ. But Jesus gives us a pretty amazing example of work ethic. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 says, He took a humble position as a slave. He chose to come as a slave. 
Luke 19 tells us that he left glory to save the lost. Mark 10 tells us Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. We all know this, but Jesus worked as a carpenter for nearly 30 years before joining his ministry. And he was sinless in his job. All of the characteristics that Paul laid out in these verses, Jesus matched and exemplified for us. And he did this because he was doing it to glorify God. So think about the exhortations Paul described in these verses. Would, would Jesus have disrespected a person while working? Would Jesus slack off when no one was watching? Would he have gone to work with a resentful attitude, or, or would he minimize his job to nothingness? Absolutely not. And neither should we in our job. Work through Christ, work like Christ, and then finally work for Christ. In your work, you should always do your best as if you were working for Jesus. One commentary puts it this way. It says, It is possible for a housewife to cook a meal as if Jesus were going to eat it, or to spring clean a house as if Jesus Christ were the honored guest. It is possible for teachers to educate children, for doctors to treat patients and nurses to care for them, for shop assistants to serve customers, accountants to audit books, and secretaries to type letters as if in each case they were serving Jesus Christ directly. The work that we do now, the work that you do now, should be for Christ. But also you need to realize that, that you will be rewarded by Christ later. Sometimes we don't really care to meditate on that part, the reward that Christ has promised us. Some people think that, that our work doesn't really matter on this earth because it'll all be wiped away someday when we go to heaven. And it's true that our works don't matter when it comes to the topic of salvation, right? We, it's only the work of Christ on the cross that has ever given us salvation. However, go back to chapter 2 of Ephesians Verse 10, and it says, He has created us anew in Christ. We have been created anew in Christ so we can do good things, good works. We talked about that, seems like forever ago. We should not overlook. And the ultimate reward, once we finally do meet Jesus face to face, we will we'll be hear the words, well done, my faithful servant. There will be no sweeter five words said in the history of, of, of everything. Now for those who are employers. I'll encourage you to also lead through Christ, like Christ, and for Christ. And it's the double-edged sword of leadership. You take on new responsibilities, you have new power, you have new authority, but you also have many more sacrifices that come along with it. And if you try to do all of that without the Spirit's power, you're going to be in trouble. Paul felt the pressure of leading churches throughout the Asia Minor region, but several times he described how it was in his weakness the grace of Jesus was sufficient. If you're a leader, then I, then I encourage you to lead out in Christ's strength, not your own. Lead like Christ. Christ was not just the model servant, but he was also the ultimate master. Christ displayed a servant leadership. His, uh, he displayed the attitudes of those in leadership now should follow. He came to serve. He took up his towel. He cared for the vulnerable. He, he uh, did not look for earthly praise. And he was a shepherd, not a dictator. Do you exemplify this type of leadership? Let 
lead through Christ, lead like Christ, and lead for Christ. Paul alludes to the idea that masters will give an account. As leaders, you may have more responsibilities, but you also have more opportunities uh, to bend the truth or, or make ethical decisions that, that are negative because you have less accountability and oversight and more control over your time. But remember that Christ is always watching. Christ is always your audience, and, and he is an impartial master. And, and what that means is that you should seek to honor and glorify him in every second, every decision that you make as, as an employer, as a leader, and seek to honor and glorify him in that. So this passage it can be taken many different ways, but, but we should take it to change the way that we work. And it should, uh, we, we should also change the way that we evaluate what's important in our life. When we look at this text about slaves and masters, what's the most important thing that Paul keeps on coming back to? It's Christ. It's the gospel. It's, it's the relationship between man and God. The most important thing in this life is not whether you work in a ranch or you work in an office building. What matters most, and what Paul's telling us here, is that what matters most is how we respond to Christ in the work that we do. So the last question I have for you today is this. Is Jesus your master? He should be. Is Jesus your master? I'll be praying that you make the decision right now to finally make him your master or, or to continue to make him your master as you do the job that God has called you to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. Father, I'm reminded that in, in, in our weaknesses, you are strong. And wherever you have us right now, whatever you have us doing, there is no excuse to forget who our master is. Father, you are the one who is in ultimate control of our lives, of our situations. Father, help us to remember that fact. Help us to glorify you as we do the job that you have called us and equipped us to do. Help us to continue to give you honor and glory when, when we do something right. And help us to give you honor and glory when we do something wrong. We love you. We thank you for today. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Emmanuel.